Yes. Begin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to minimize this and screen share our presentation. Yeah. Okay. Getting the slideshow. Everyone can see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So welcome to week three, which is the halfway point. The road ahead, we have this remaining, which is today we're going to talk about the art and science of preparation. What can help you minimize, or I should say, minimize your time while maximizing your return. For week four, we're going to look at a different lesson style. If you remember last week, we looked at a very linear and logical progression. We're going to look at a style that actually might reduce the amount of work you do. And it will integrate your students studying outside of the class or lesson, however you want to call it, and what you do when you meet. Finally, we're going to go to week five, we'll wrap things up. I also want to talk a little bit about the features of English because it's a very interesting language. Uh, I'm sure when you looked at the training documents, it talked a lot about features of grammar. Like if you meet your students, you might ask yourself where to begin in English since it's so fast. If I teach her something, is that good? <laughs> is there something better? <laughs> Maybe. Well, let's look at the assignments. We only have two left. I should say two weeks. Uh, for after this week, again, I ask you to read the training document for week four and bring at least one question for a discussion. We'll talk about some skills today with technology, such as screen sharing, which may be intuitive or simple, really depends. And I want to check in with you over this week to see if we can do that uh, without a hitch, because I think getting that out of the way will really help us. Mm. Right? Yes. Since we're also talking about, or I should say, since at this time you have an idea of how a lesson can be structured, we talked about what's important. Like, if you had to choose between two activities, and one was something that the student could do independently, and one that required the student to communicate, for your interaction, probably you should choose the communicative task, the communicative, the communicative activity. And after today, you'll have more resources like the screen share, split screen, whiteboard, which might give you some inspiration about what you can do with your student. So just come up with an idea, prepare one ESL activity, English as a second language, to share with the class at the beginning, just like we go over any questions, for example. Okay, and finally, begin the process of reaching out to your students, connecting, and figuring out the logistics. Ruth was telling me that she has had some success with this. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Britt, yeah. did you also have I spoke. Um, I spoke to her on the phone um, and we talked about which days are free for her and for me so we can plan on getting together those days. Awesome. That's great. So this is moving ahead more efficiently than I hoped, but it's good. Like we said when we talked about the process of learning a language, speaking as soon as possible will affect your results because learning by doing is highly effective. Same thing for your training. If you start act, interacting with your student as soon as possible, you will get the ball rolling and you will be able to, for the next two weeks, take what you learn and directly apply it to the person you've met or contacted. Okay. And then we have an assignment between week four and week five, five being our last. Again, read and bring a question. I hope that we can have you do one online lesson with the student and we can do something really simple, like an article lesson. We'll talk about that today. Uh, and um, I want to see if you can make a rough plan, like a skeleton for a lesson. 
Uh, and if you bring that to the class, we can all have kind of like a brainstorming session about, well, that's a really good idea. Why do you want to do that? And what else could go here? And we can all have some input and talk about how this lesson structure is organized and what's good about it. Okay. So I hope that gives you some feedback and inspiration. But focus on week three. That's what you need to think about between now and week four. Okay. So let's talk about what we did between last session and today's session. <clears throat> did you visit the classes? Yeah. Yes. And Ruth are both nodding yes. That's great. We went so, to the same one. <laughs> please, uh, could you tell me what you observed? They Sorry. seem to have a, well, he, what he was saying is that he had a, some questions available just from the beginning to have a conversation with the people in his class. And he seemed to have like prepared like even follow up with questions just to generate conversation, initial conversation, which I thought was interesting for current events so that they could talk about that. Which class was this? Um, conversation, topics for conversation, I think it was called. On Monday. Uh okay How i thought many? it was um interesting that he had that newspaper uh i guess it's called uh, easy english or something newspaper mm -hmm. and he was using that as the um point of uh beginning a conversation and it was talking about current events very nice okay how many students were in attendance uh, three. three okay how was the participation One of the students seemed to do most of the talking. <laughs> and and one was very unsure of, of speaking at all. She kept saying, I can't, I'm, I'm bad, I can't do this. And the other one was quiet, but um, she, she knew what to say. She just kind of waited. And then when he let her talk, she really talked a lot, so. I think it's going to take a lot of creativity to translate traditional classroom activities to the Zoom meeting because everyone's face is much more upfront. Uh, this is an activity where a lot of people are deprived of their ability to express themselves, which can be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Also embarrassing. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when I try to speak, I'm fairly confident in Russian, but I know I have a, lot, a long way to go. But when I speak in front of people, I second guess myself more. Like that's not completely correct. And I, I know they don't know, <laughs> it's less good, but I feel not so good. Mm. Uh, so in a class, you might be able to pair people off and the teacher is the only person who walks around and investigates <clears throat> uh, to see the condition of the students. So. Uh, what do you think the teacher did well? He, he encouraged the students through, throughout the class. And even though if they seemed hesitant to speak, he said there, it's the best thing to do is just to try. You know, he, he, and saying that this was a safe space and he was very encouraging in that. Mm -hmm. Good point. And he's right. Uh, failure is like the condition of success. I don't think you can succeed without making mistakes. Okay. Uh, if you were in his position and knowing what you now know, what would you do differently for the next class? I was, they seemed, he did ask for feedback at the end and it was interesting. So I thought that was really good. So he's actually learning what it was. And they, I don't know, they seem to want homework so that they could read the articles that we spent reading in class so that they would have already read them. And then that way they could have spent more time just talking during the class. Good point. Okay, what else? What else? 
Um, it, it seemed lopsided. Um, I think you need to uh, direct it at each person. It, it seemed, you know, one person was doing most of the talking and I think you need to just give the others the chance. And I don't like to put people on the spot, but you know, that they have to participate too, so. I think, and you can contradict me, but I think the PowerPoint translates well to Zoom. So if I want to encourage you to speak, we basically stop at a point and we open up some conversation. Uh, do you think that works well? I mean, what, what we're doing now, this PowerPoint? In the training. Yeah. I think so, yeah, because you stop, yeah, you yeah. do stop, and then you ask us questions, or you're like, you pick a specific person. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage participation. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, just to make sure that what we do is successful, it might be good to have a standard method. And I think the PowerPoint kind of keeps things on track. So this mm -hmm. is good for the Zoom meeting. I don't know how a conversation class, which we've always operated, how easy that is to have in a Zoom meeting. It's like, okay, everyone step back. We have two. It's two people talking and they're like, mm, good job. Okay, next. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for completing that part of the assignments. How about questions from the reading? Questions from the reading. Um, you mean uh, the week three we, uh, reading, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the one question I had is, um, how do you use that ESL skills assessment? That was at the end of the chapter. What is it referring to? Um, yeah. Well, it says this is a form for tracking your students' progress. So, but then it says, I need to learn more English to talk on the phone, talk to my neighbors. So do you ask the student that or you, you just, I, I don't know how you use it. Honestly, I don't, I've never used it myself. Oh, okay. Now there's, it's a good idea. So you could adapt that to track and note what's gone well in your lessons. In fact, if you meet with your student, you can ask, how did it go? Ask yourself, how was it? What worked and what didn't work? Uh, that would give you over time. I'm not saying it'll happen over every week, but after a while you can say, well, let's read the notes. Like, oh, I forgot about that. And it'll give you a sense of the direction that your student tutor interaction is going your shared goal of the student becoming more successful uh how is that progressing over time you can observe it with a journal like that so that skills assessment paper mm -hmm. i've never used and we don't collect that information so i think that's only for your benefit however I want to test the students. So it would be good to have like a control, like an exam where we say at the beginning, they're this level. And after so many meetings, they've made this much improvement. So we'd say year by year, the student makes this much difference. So thanks for that idea. I guess I don't have any notes handy. I'll just watch the video. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Well, I, this is a follow up to your uh, to, to Britt's question about that. I know you said you didn't use it, but I, I read that and it's just kind of a list. And it was funny because I was thinking it was like, I could use it um, when I first, uh, like during that coffee talk or not coffee talk, but like this little coffee meeting, just to talk to her to see if there's anything specific on there that she wanted to learn. And then I could just use that as a jumping off point for what her main interests are. I mean, that's what I was, I was just looking for, but I, I guess I, uh, I could just use it for note taking, but, uh, but my, my question related to some of these uh, dialogues that they had in the activities that they had going throughout um, at the very beginning, 
I guess I became nervous after speaking with my student. So uh, I was concerned that it was a little bit more of an intermediate level. And I think my student is more of a beginner level. But then I went back to, um, so I guess this is just more of a comment. I calmed myself down by going back to, I think, week one, where there was a little bit more for a beginning level type conversation that I could concentrate on and just talk with, talk about. Now, the title of week three, this mm -hmm. document, is it intermediate traits, traits of the intermediate student? Yeah. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why I moved away from these documents because you might not end up with a student um, over years of working with us and who that is relevant to. So instead of giving you this large amount of abstract information, I wanted to give you the pieces, like the system you could use to adapt to your student. So in your case, Ruth, it seems that your student is a beginner yeah. therefore the dialogue is a good model uh, the audio lingual method we talked about during week one is probably something that you could that is related to that dialogue method basically when you're getting to know your students you're going to have to communicate with her and saying the english orally and showing it and the translation that's substantial in itself so you can ask basic questions like what do you want to accomplish mm -hmm. what does it mean it means this okay what do you want to accomplish and then they say ah right they figure it out this is very basic maybe they can express themselves more than that Okay. And then they can show you, and then you can say, ah, I want to get a driver's license. And then you teach them that phrase. Okay. That's a brick by brick method. Okay. I think it's, like, I when we started, in fact, maybe it wasn't with this training program. It was the what it takes to learn a language presentation. Did anyone go to the website and watch that? What it takes to learn a language? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can go there and we'll elaborate. I talked about the two ends of the spectrum, the brick by brick building up of language and just going out into the water. So if you're in the sea of the environment, like in America, for example, that is a constant opportunity. But if you can't swim, you'll drown. Maybe not drown, you just won't learn. So you have to have the alphabet. 95% uh, of what we say is made up of 100 words. So if you have that, it's a really big step. And you can recognize a lot of what people are saying. So the pieces that you're missing are just the vocab you don't know. So it's not so hard to start from nothing teaching phrases and teaching basic vocabulary because eventually you get up to most of what people say then comes to what's relevant to them like i want to get a driver's license okay over and above that they live in america so they can hopefully be bombarded by the necessity to read and listen and interact Sometimes that's not, that's not necessary. You can have family members who handle your affairs, basically. But they do have the opportunity. Okay? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. And let's move on to today's topic. So today's topic is how to prepare well without wasting time. Uh, there's five points. We're going to talk about optimizing your return on investment. In this case, it's just the effort you put in. So what quality of instruction do you provide based on how much time and energy you spend yourself? And we'll talk about how much time typically it takes to repair. A very important thing for you, point three, well begun is half done. 
I think it might make the process very easy. Maybe not at first, see why. Uh, number four, what are the factors of minimizing preparation? And number five, those are the resources. So these are the tools you accumulate. Today you'll get basically the principal pieces. Just like we said, in language, there's 100 words that form up most. I think with this the lesson structure we talked about already, that's the fundamentals of language teaching. So the rest you kind of just come across as you need it. So those are the resources you're going to get today. References, games, and tools. Let's move on. So we said the first thing was optimizing your return on investment. Many things in the world are basically optimization problems. Not all relationships are linear relationships. I'll show you on the next slide what a linear graph looks like. So basically it means that when you put in effort. Quiet. That a bird? Sorry. Yeah. Wow. Hang on. Did the bird get in the house? You'd be surprised the kind of animals that like appear in my students. Oh, lessons. really? Like the cat will appear and then it will <laughs> bite the screen where the X button is. And close the lesson. <laughs> They're very smart. <laughs> I don't know what got into them. Okay. So not all outputs are linear. Some outputs have more complicated shapes. Let's look at what that is. So this is an example of linear dependence. Here we have a weight versus price graph. So maybe you're buying apples at the market. Apples cost a dollar per pound. As you buy more apples, the price will go up in a linear relationship. It's not something that's quadratic like this. So this is, this kind of problem is like the area of a rectangle. So you can change the lengths, the heights of the sides, for example, and the length. And it tries to ask you which of these makes the maximum size. Uh, and one point on this relationship is the maximum. I show you this because some things like physical training, like your body, are the same way. Right? You put in a certain amount of effort, good, now your training is effective. You keep going and you start to break down your cartilage. You start to get arthritis. Your muscles aren't healing in time. You feel sick. Maybe you're doing something that requires a lot of strength and your nervous system is now starting to have problems because it's, it's all a chemical and electrical process. It can't do what you're asking it to do. That's when you're going over the hill and you're in the well done steak, the burnt steak territory. Uh, before we move on, just another graph. Uh, to make an analogy about language learning in general, I wanted to show you these two graphs. One is linear and one is a punctuated equilibrium graph. So my question is, which graph do you think is closer to the language learning process? Probably the second one. Yeah. Two guess, yeah. I like, I like probable guesses. <laughs> it would be great if it was, you know, just a straight line. But yes, many students uh, get frustrated because they've been training for a long, long time now. And they're not seeing any progress. Mm -hmm. They're in one of those middle regions, the long and slow improvement regions. Because this is a mental activity, it's a mental skill, usually there's an aha moment mm. where all of your effort kind of gets to this new level. And uh, in my opinion, probably it looks something more like this. It's not a linear graph. Okay, so the shape of your investment and preparation is the same kind as this. Uh, don't do too much. I recommend that you stop when you know enough is enough and that doing any more is not going to help you or your students. Okay. 
So let's ask us, let's ask ourselves, how long should preparation take? The rule of thumb that's passed around in the teaching community, in my experience, pretty accurate. Uh, creative preparation usually requires two hours of preparation for every one hour of instruction. So if you have a class that's, the class itself, you teaching in front of the students is 90 minutes. How many minutes do you think you will be preparing? Oh, uh, 180. 40. Yeah, so that's a long time. Yeah. You, you're gonna spend three hours for that 90 minutes at first. Um, the reason that holds very true for classroom teaching is because the variables are higher in number. Uh, there's a lot more to consider, so the creative process takes more effort. Choosing the goal is therefore more complex. Sometimes, if you have a track, like a curriculum, and you're in like the public school system, maybe not. That doesn't mean it's effective, though. The researching and designing the plan then takes a long time because you have to teach something, and you have to stay fresh on this material, and maybe you're not familiar with it. We're native speakers of English, so we are masters of this skill, but we may not know why or how to explain it to somebody, and that could be difficult. Okay, and then there's the constructing materials portion. So after you do all of that, you say, okay, great, we're gonna do this game, and now I have to make it. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I like the one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, because it eliminates that high volume preparation requirement where you're in the printing room just wasting, you feel guilty the amount of paper that you produce on a daily basis. Like this, this, there has to be a better way, is what you're thinking. Okay. So that two to one ratio is pretty accurate for classroom teaching, but I think it's less accurate for tutoring because there's fewer variables. Mm, you might have very clear steps forward. You know what to do. You agreed on what to do with your students. You made that journal that shows this is what's been going well and our progress is in this direction. More flexibility. So because you only have to negotiate on what you are going to do with one person, uh, you don't have to serve the common denominator need of a larger group. You can do whatever this person happens to want that day or whatever is best for them that day. It's hard to find something that's best for everybody. Uh, and again, less volume of work. Maybe you won't have to, if you print something, it might be one piece of paper instead of 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was something I wanted to say about this. Might be on the next slide. I guess the gist is on the next slide. So is there such a thing as not improving at all and not preparing at all? In my opinion, yes. Uh, and it can be valid, just like improv comedy. Mm, to be there is difficult, especially for the class. It's not that it's impossible, uh, but if you try to fly off the cuff, if that's a phrase, in the class, probably you're going to crash and you will not have, you will be irresponsible in your position. You will not have the authority you should have as an instructor. Uh, but for the private tutoring, I think it's completely feasible because it's a very, it's a single infraction. However, if you're a master, probably you can improvise even in the class. So let's talk about that. How do we get to that period, that state where we can kind of just use what we know whenever we need it without doing a lot of preparation? So I have this phrase here, which I really like, well begun is half done, or as I call it, the full throttle technique. Why? So I don't choose these images. I do like this like intelligent, like auto generation. And if I say cruise, as you see cruise is in the third one, it chooses the cruise ship. If I say plane, maybe it chooses the plane. So I said, this is for you, and it gave me a winking face. So I said, well, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> All 
right, so the full throttle technique to start off well. This is for you because I don't think it's good to impose on another person. It's something you should impose on yourself. The idea is that you can basically look at your start, like the takeoff of the plane. When the plane has to get off the ground, it has to go full throttle. Right? It can't hold anything back as it's going down the runway. After it gets to a certain speed, physics takes over and you have lift and you get up and up and up and up and up to cruising altitude. Now, we relax, okay? I think it's the same way when you start something new. So here you're a new tutor with the Literacy Volunteers of Southern Connecticut, and you might say, how much preparation should I do at the beginning? Uh, you might end up doing more than I said, maybe a three to one ratio. I'm not asking you to do that. You could, by all means, <laughs> but if you do it, I'm not saying that's going to last forever. This is your full throttle moment where you work hard in the beginning and you, through that effort, you get enough skill that you're going to cruise for the rest of your career. I'm not saying that I'm at that state, but I do a lot of improv with my online teaching and it works well for the students. So. I know it was, it took me maybe two years to get to that point, but cruising now is very enjoyable. And I think it's beneficial for both the student and I. Okay, so that's your ticket to improv. If you can use the full throttle technique, then by all means, just whatever you have, whatever the student brings to the table, or the class brings to the table, probably what can serve them is inside your brain and you can use it. Okay, so let's talk about minimizing preparation. To minimize preparation, the, this depends on four factors. So first one is experience. The more you do something, the less you have to learn. There's like a dual burden of like executing the task and learning about what you're doing. So when you basically are comfortable with the learning stimulus. Your mind expands, like you have finite resources, your mind expands to deal with the execution. So with experience, your preparation time would be more efficient. Knowledge of your students. So if you know your students, again, you basically have downloaded the information you need to decide what should we do in this lesson. If you don't have that, you might have to figure it out. That takes time. Okay, knowledge of the types of students. So you might know what typically helps an intermediate student, what typically helps a beginning student, or a student who comes from a certain language background. So there might be very strong reading skills and writing skills in a Japanese student because their school system emphasizes that. And in proportion, they seem to not emphasize speaking until much later. So they might have advanced vocabulary, but they're having trouble putting it together in the moment with you. So that's knowledge of the types of students. Today, we're going to focus on the resources. So if you have ready resources, your games, your references, your tools, then you don't have to search for them. Again, this is just, you don't have to be creative and say like, well, what do I do? You already know, you've done it before. Or you've seen it before. So the first one was that references. I say references because probably they're collections of materials that you can use for research. We provide the I Speak English by Ruth Johnson Colvin, I think. Brit already stopped off, stopped yeah. by and picked it up. Yeah, uh, I have, Ruth, it. have you obtained the I Speak English app? I have not gone yet. I, but what are the hours again that I can go? The time that I can go to get it? Let's go to the website. Uh, oh, because I can, do, I can go to the website. You don't need to do that. I can do that. 
Because sometimes I, th I think that because yeah. of the pandemic, the hours have changed. Because I was there yeah. the other day, and they were Tammy was there later, which was convenient. Oh, okay. Yeah, just call Tammy and set up a time with her. That's okay. the best. Yeah. Good idea. So yes, uh, the I Speak English is a resource about how to teach as a tutor, um, what types of students you might encounter, and so on. We also offer the Challenger Adult Reading Series. We have many volumes of this series, and they contain readings with vocabulary and comprehension exercises. This is in paper. Now, I think these sorts of things are available online, but it's leveled, and your students can be tested to determine which book is good for them. And if they try it and they say, well, actually, I want to go up or I want to go down, that's fine. Just get another volume. So that's a resource that you can use with your student. Uh, so Ruth, in your case, if your student is a beginner, we have the beginner books and you can start okay. there. Okay. However, I encourage you to explore online because the amount and quality of free references, which you don't have to lug around in a bag, uh, is increasing every day. Not just the references, but the tools and the games. It's all on the internet. Is all of it good? I think some might be better than others, but it's all generally effective. Uh, use your best judgment if this is quality material or not. So besides that, you can invest your own, in your own library. Here, I, might, I think I pointed out before, I have my bookshelf down there. It's a top layer, it's mostly English teaching books, and it's good. I think it helps me. Uh, for example, I used this book a lot when I taught classroom English for teens in New York City. So it's a collection of games. And it provided a lot of inspiration because again, something that's in here might not be directly applicable based on your resources or based on what students you're working with but it can inspire you. And inspiration is probably the best thing in a creative activity. Okay, let's move on. We're gonna talk about games, which are really great. So games are a really fun way to lighten the mood in the classroom or in the tutoring session. If everything is very academic, you can feel that the enthusiasm kind of dies with it. You, won't, you don't want things to be wild, which is another consideration. Because so I've done, I've had a great idea for a fun game, and I'm like, I'll do this first. And then for the rest of the time, I'll lose control of the class because, oh, they're really energized, and now they can't sit down. So you want to have that balance. Okay, so let's talk about some in the classroom examples only briefly because we're gonna focus on the tutoring. So in the classroom, I think games are good as a warm up because people come in, maybe it's early in the morning, uh, it's now they're in a social setting and they might be a little nervous, for example. So what do we do to warm them up? And I think games work really well. Uh, these two basically have facilitated this process in a lot of my classes. So one is board race, which is basically you divide the class into two or more teams, give each a piece of chalk, and you give a theme on the board, like adjective. It's a simple one. And they have to write a word that's related to the theme. So they start behind a line, and they have the chalk, and I say, go. And they run and they have to say an adjective. And they run back and pass it to the next person online, go to the back. And the next person runs forward and writes the next. And they do that for about a minute. And the team that writes the most adjectives wins. So it gets the brain flowing. They build connections. So like, what are the adjectives I know? That's a simple one. You could say something more complicated, like mm, you either have to match the first letter or rhyme the last sound 
in a line. So that can be pretty challenging, but it's fun, especially for practicing pronunciation. Okay. Uh, you can use a between strenuous material. So this is learning and it's serious learning. So some of the activities can be brain intensive. To give the students a break, you might want to use a game. And you can use something that's just fun, like apples to apples, which is basically an English vocabulary association game. Have you played apples to apples? Mm -mm. I don't want to explain it here. But I, I actually, I think it might be beneficial. The way I do it with my students is I usually have them make it because I don't have a set and it would take me forever to do it. So I have two colors of construction paper, like bright green, like a Granny Smith apple, and red for apple. And I'll fold it into eight rows, then fold it again, so that when you unfold it, it has these rectangles. And then you can cut, use your scissors to cut the rectangles, and now you have basically cards. And you pass these out to the students, give a pile of red to one student, pile of green to another, and you ask the students, uh, those with the green cards, please find an adjective from this magazine. So they have to read and search, they find an adjective, and they write them, as many as they can, on these green cards. So, okay, red cards, please find a noun, right, from this magazine. So I give them a different magazine, and they collect nouns so they can write down. Then, we gather them together, groups of five maybe. And the way you play is you take turns. One person is like a judge. They have the adjective cards and they put the adjective down and the other students have like a hand, like a deck of cards of the nouns. And they have to pick one of the nouns that's, that best fits the adjective that's on the table. So they place it, and then the judge gets to choose, without anyone knowing, so this is somehow concealed, right? Then the judge gets to choose, oh, you know what, I think, mm, I don't know, country is the most enormous thing in this group. So the adjective was enormous, someone had house, someone had country, someone had elephants, and they say, oh, you know, I think country, that's the best one. Say, ha, I win. So you get the green adjective card. At the end of the game, the person who has collected the most green adjective cards is the winner. So it involves, it takes work off of me because the students make it and they make it by reading and identifying adjectives. And then they make associations between the games, between the words during the game. So I think it's a really good game. Uh, grammar charades, just a simple example. Uh, for one situation, I had a class act out what they did. Uh, for example, like this, they brushing their teeth. And the other students in their group had to ask, have you brushed your teeth today? So that's the construction. Have you brushed your teeth today? And then the person, if it's correct, they say, yes, I have. Or if it's wrong, they say, no, I haven't. So it teaches them that mm, short answer form and the question construction form. I'm doing this, I was doing this before because apparently in Korea, this is how you read a book. <laughs> so if you're reading a book, this is reading a book. And all the other students are like, I don't know, what are you doing? <laughs> So different gestures mean different things in different countries. It's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, you can get creative and harmonize fun with exertion. So two of the favorite creations I made during this, during my experience as a teacher was vocab baseball and grammar football. I don't want to take complete credit for the vocab baseball because again, I was reading my resource reference and they had a very similar game. Like, ah, I know how I can do that for my students. But basically, it's you combine 
two ideas, English teaching with something that already has a system you understand, like baseball. So in vocab baseball, um, I had uh, vocab words that we learned during the week on slips of paper. And I gave them to the pitching team and what, so I divide the class into two, one's a pitching team and one's a batting team. The pitching team has to go through their options of vocab words and choose which one to offer to someone on the batting team. And when the batting team person gets the word, they have to make a sentence, <laughs> okay? Now, if they can't do it, maybe they can give the type. Oh, you know, I don't know, I don't remember what that is, but I know it's a noun, okay, single. So I, on the floor, I have these pieces of paper, right, single, they go to first base. So, so I, oh, you know, I don't, I can't use it in a sentence, but I know it means so-and-so, okay, double. So got double, someone actually makes a good sentence, good, go to triple. If they ma I made it like a quality thing, like if it was a great sentence, that's a home run. <laughs> so it was fun, it was a good game. Grammar football is too complicated to explain. <laughs> I, pro I probably should because it's interesting, but maybe at another time. I like that one because it was actually completely my idea and not inspired, but we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> so uh, in one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is our focus, these games, I've found to be, they don't require any materials. You can do them online and they don't really fail. So they don't get boring. I'm not saying that you should do them all the time because then you can force them to be boring. But if you need a trick, so to speak, to pull out, to fill up the time of the session, this usually is fun. So conversation games like Guess the Animal or 20 Questions. Guess the animal is 20 questions, except that the only thing you choose is some kind of animal. Mm -hmm. And there's not a limit, so you don't lose after 20 questions. And that's good for children, for example, or beginners. And I might have explained this before, but it teaches the construction of questions, which you might be surprised, even in intermediate and advanced students still something that they haven't perfected out of habit or because the grammar system is completely different. So they still think in Chinese and they translate it to English and there's something that's not exactly in the same way. So just building this habit early of playing this game, can it fly? Sometimes they say, is it can it fly? There's, I know it's a question and I know what they're asking but it's not grammatically correct. So playing this game with a child where they're asking, is it eat meat instead of does it eat meat? You can help them build the habit of the correct instruction over and over again. Okay, this or that, it's pretty easy. I think, I think English people play that like, okay, would you rather have pizza or sushi? All right, and then you say, why? Would you rather watch this movie or that movie? And why? Mm. So it's good. The thing is, it goes back and forth. So there's not just pressure on the one person. So the tutor can go, student can go, tutor can go, and so on. Collaborative story is really fun. So if you're creative, you want to talk about, you want to just like do a sentence of a story, and then the next sentence is done by the other participant. Uh, that one is probably the most popular of the ones in this list. Make a connection is abstract though it doesn't have to be. Uh, for example, if I had, I don't want to use this, I, mean, I can't really do the same one that my student did. So my student had a book and a teddy bear. And she said, what's the connection? I said, they both start with B. So that's simple. Uh, for more advanced students, you can say something more distant, like, gold and grass. What's, what's the connection between gold and grass? And you kind of have to give a speech 
for one minute. The connection between gold and grass is that humanity is motivated by certain fundamental desires. One of them is the desire for this idea of opulence, where the other is this desire to have food. And the basis of food is grass, and the basis of opulence is money, which is represented by gold. So it's like a challenge that you can give to an advanced student. Okay. Questions are the answer. Is bizarre. We should probably play <laughs> is that it like one. like Jeopardy? <laughs> we should probably play that one. Yes. Mm. Let's try playing. So, Britt, do you want to try? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's basi basically we're going to have a conversation, but we can't answer. We have to ask a question. So, for example, uh, fake scenario. Uh, are you going to the game today? And I'm supposed to answer with a question? Yeah. Like, which game do you mean? Oh, I see. I see. Right. Are you going to the game today? <laughs> which game do you mean? <laughs> Uh, is it the one at the stadium or at the field? <laughs> that, that's pretty tough. For her. This can melt your mind. Yeah. And like you, the question, like want, you have to subconsciously answer the question and then you have to catch yourself and say, ah, I'm supposed to not answer the question, but like avoid it with another question. Like, why do you ask? <laughs> Don't you trust me? <laughs> it sounds paranoid. <laughs> it's, a, it's a crazy game, but I like it. So you can get creative with these things. Let's go to the next one. Your toolbox, uh, specifically for online tutoring with video technology. We're going to go over four. And like I said, between this week and next week, these are the tools that I want to check, troubleshoot with you. So let's get right to it. Let me read them off first. So we're going to look at screen share, split screen, whiteboard, and articles. So screen share. Even now, we're using this because you're communicating visually. One of the main benefits of this before I intended to use it was basically I could not communicate otherwise. I had to point to what it was. So I was explaining to a student, no, no, this is what that word is. And it's just not connected because it's, you know, we're learning language. So I open up Google Images and I screen share that. Very, very helpful. Uh, so again, you can use that intentionally in a planned way by showing images. For example, if you want to teach dangerous and safe, you might say, I shouldn't say her name, uh, Mary. Mary, could you circle the boring thing? Could you circle the dangerous thing? I don't have like pictures on a board and they'll circle it or point to it, right? So it's a good way to make a visual connection with the word. Ruth, since you're working with the beginning students, I assume probably screen share will help you a lot because you can have images. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that whole Google Translate intermediate. You can substitute pictures for the text and simply say it. Okay. Okay. And this gets everyone synchronized on what is happening or what the topic is. Because mm, sometimes in the communication process, mm, we lose focus or something is ambiguous. So if I'm editing 
a report or a resume with the student. And I'm trying to explain, you need to capitalize this. And I literally mean this, like this word with T-H-I-S. It's not capitalized uh, and it's not registering. Then I can have the screen share and I can highlight it with my mouse. So there's no confusion. So if we're looking at the same picture and you can see my mouse, it's very helpful. Okay, so I say here this is a required skill because I really don't think you will have a good time if you don't use it in your teaching. Um, as a standard for our volunteers, I think it should be required also. So please follow up with me and we'll troubleshoot the coming week. Uh, let's take a second for any questions before we move on. Zoom, um, I mean, I use Zoom pretty often, mm. but I was wondering, I just use the free Zoom account. Yeah, me too. Do they allow for that, for the screen share? I believe so. I uh, know that there's a time limit. Time limit, yeah. But that's only if it's over three people, right? So that's what I was concerned about, because if it's just one-on-one -on -one with a, one student, we should be okay for the hour. Well, you've reached the depth of my knowledge. <laughs> so that's, I really, uh, I really don't know. I knew there was a time limit. Uh, I use Skype. Uh, Sorry, okay. Zoom. I know we're using Zoom now. Mm -hmm. You're great. You can see it works. <laughs> but I, Skype does not have a time limit in my experience. So it works mm -hmm. well enough, especially for a one-on-one -on -one call. Mm -hmm. uh, I, do, do you have to have an account to use Skype? You have to set up an account? Yes, you do. Same and way with Zoom, I believe. And it's free? Yes, it is. Same thing with the Same Google, the comparative Google, uh, the comparable Google applications. If you have a Gmail, you should be able to access it. Okay. So your student also has to have that platform? Great point. Yes. So probably you should communicate about what the options are. So if you have problems with one, you could use the alternative. Um, if you have more possible matches, that's good. If you have familiarity with various kinds, that's good also. So in my case, I have Zoom and I know how to use it well enough. That could be an alternative for me if my student doesn't have Skype. Okay. 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 Good question. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Then let's move on. Talk about split screen, which is not a skill directly related only to tutoring online. It's basically just you should be aware of how you can increase your workflow by organizing what you're seeing better. So if you need to see two things at once, you should change your screen so that's happening. Some students don't know about it, so you will have to explain it to them. Again, they it might not be easy to point it out. That's where screen share comes in handy. I have the additional technique of moving my whole monitor arm so I can like point like I'm I'm talking about this location for example it might save me some time but screen share is a way that you could explain the same thing I used to do something even worse which was I'd hold up my phone and it reflects a little so I'd take a mirror and I'm like that right there <laughs> it was kind of fun but um I like this better so yeah, you can improve your workflow. One of the most, I think a larger benefit besides just workflow uh, for this context is mm -hmm. you're not going to miss any information. If you don't see the student's face or the student doesn't see your face, you are missing. I think they say like 85% of communication is not mm -hmm. just verbal, meaning like the logic and arrangement of the words. It's how you say it and stretch it and what is the feeling and the timbre and the voice at the same time. What is the emotion on the face? If you're missing that and the student's missing that, it's a big loss, um, especially for speaking because I'm, I'll speculate that maybe we have a way of saying things, like a cultural way 
of how we will act when we say something. And that might be a benefit, but probably just the pronunciation. Mm, that depends on how your mouth looks. So when I'm teaching my students pronunciation, I often point to my mouth or I'll move the screen this way so they can see my mouth from the side. And I'll say, here's an example. Uh, is there a difference between ear and year? So for us, we know, yes, there's ear, and then it's the year 2020. How does that look in your mouth? Because it's hard for them to hear, and it's hard for them to understand what are you doing. So from the side is the only way you can really see the difference. When you do ear, everything is kind of neutral. When you do year, you have to, like, project it. So your whole like jaw and like energy, you can see year, <laughs> you have to shoot it out. <laughs> so it's the only way they can see it is if actually they have a visual on you. Other things like, um, I work with this for Japanese students a lot, but I guess also students from Taiwan, so it might be an Asian language feature or rather it's a feature of English that doesn't exist in other languages. It's the movement of the corners of your mouth, which is kind of, you can see it when I'm talking. There's, a, I go into smiles when I say A and E all the time. And some Asian languages, it will stay completely like in this range. So I have to say, you have to do it stronger, all right? A, the reason you're not saying A and it's like an A, A is because you're here. You have to go A all the way out. <laughs> so you need a visual. So uh, there's so many features of English that when we get to week five, we won't be able to cover them. That's one interesting thing. We have a lot of action in our mouths and a lot of strength in our tongues which is hard for some people to do because in they actually don't have the muscle development. So I say, no, no, press harder, right? You're not getting the L sound because you're not pressing strongly enough on your teeth. But yeah, that all requires a visual explanation. Hmm. So you, you need to make sure the visual is maintained because sometimes there's a chat. So if you're sending messages to communicate and they're looking at something else, you're not on the same page. And eventually it leads to confusion. Like, you remember that message I sent you? Like, what message? I didn't get any messages. And you didn't realize that there was a signal problem and you, your messages didn't arrive. So you were talking about something you sent them and they were nodding, uh-huh, uh-huh. But because it's like, they don't speak English very well. So like, yes, I think. Yes, um, it may not be possible to split the screen on a mobile device. So I think all of us are using PCs or laptops currently. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using a small screen, maybe you can't. Mm, if you can avoid that, I might recommend it. But at the same time, there's a huge convenience to being able to use this anywhere. So, you know, it's a trade off. Okay, again. Uh, please follow up with Tim on this skill. We'll see how it works. Whiteboards are really fun. So many apps have them built in. Let's take a look. Zoom has one. I'll stop the share. And I'm going to go? destroy it. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm going to bring it back this time with the whiteboard. So now you should be looking at this whiteboard here. Let me say squiggle. I'm not going to say a word because I take time to draw. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So this might help with your communication. Uh, I'm not very familiar with zooms, though it seems to me to be very versatile. I can make a stamp. I guess I can't change the size. The one I wanted to show you today is my favorite. So let me open that up to do a new share and go to here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the slideshow just temporarily. 
and open it with my Google Chrome. So let me coordinate this. Minimize, minimize. Are you looking at this screen? So now it's blank. No, it says whiteboards. It says whiteboards. And there's a bunch of boxes underneath it. Let me stop the share. So I'm gonna. This makes it easier for me to coordinate. You cannot minimize Zoom when you're recording. Now I'm in a pickle. I'm in a pickle because I have the PowerPoint open on one screen, which has like no X's, <laughs> and then I have the Zoom meeting on the other. Okay, I'll figure it out. Uh, do I, have to, I guess we might have to do this the hard way. If I press escape, what happens? Okay, good. So that's the brute force way. Just like pressing the power button, you press escape. So let me open up Google Chrome. And now that I have it open, this is, like I said, there's some nuances to Zoom which are kind of unfamiliar and counterintuitive to me. So now I should be sharing just the Google Chrome. Google. Let's go to whiteboardfox.com. This is my favorite because it's so simple. I'm here at the website. Start drawing. Who can edit? Me or anybody? Easy. Create whiteboard. So now I have this whiteboard available. Here at the top is the unique whiteboard URL. Only for this one. So after this is destroyed, it never exists again. And anyone who is at this link can draw on this board. So I'm going to send this to you in the chat of the Zoom. Control C, and I'll see if I can have that work. So I'm going to stop the share. And I'm going to send it in the chat. Let's go here. And message to everybody, Control B. So try clicking on this link in the chat and let me know if you can open it. Okay. If you have it open, try drawing on the screen. I think I see somebody. Yes, okay, good, see it's working. You can change the color. Let me know, Britt, if it works out for you. What? There you go. Um. <laughs> Oh, here I am in the blue. Uh, hi. Good. So as you can see, we're all participating. This, in my opinion, is a lot better. Let me uh, screen share this. Actually, I don't want to do that because uh, even though I'm not capturing what I'm visualizing here, uh, I think it's more beneficial just to have us see it. Now, mm, do I have that next? My favorite is Whiteboard Fox. Okay. This requires the split screen skill. So I'm looking at you now. I have two monitors. So this is basically the split screen skill extended because I can have one thing on this screen and then another thing on the other monitor. So all I'm seeing is the whiteboard. Are we supposed to be seeing the people too? No. No. But that's, you possibly could if you arrange your screen. I'm not asking you to do that now. Uh, I see. <laughs> so it looks like you know, Ruth can see us. I, I can see, see everybody and the whiteboard. All I see is whiteboard. Can you move it? Move it. Like try to change the size and move it to the corner so that you can fill the other part of the screen with okay. Zoom. Um, if you grasp the top, of the top market. What I have to do is get the people. It's like the people are all, um, what do you call it? In the way? Full screen. If I exit full screen, um, I can sort of arrange it. One useful thing might be to drag it to the corner, which is something I just did. So that's why I'm looking here now. Okay. I dragged the whiteboard fox to the corner and it auto size to half, and then it asks me, what do you want to put on the other side? And I said, zoom. So now I have zoom on one side and the whiteboard on the other. There we go. Good. Is this through Firefox? So you've got to open up through Firefox? 
And it just happens to have the name Fox. It is oh, not related. It's not Google. I, oh, it's I've used it with Google Chrome, and I had other tabs open on my other internet browser, so I decided I'll show this Google Chrome. Okay, let me demonstrate something else you can do with this. So I said you could be creative. Let me erase our beautiful drawings. How are you erasing it? There's a button on the side. On the side. Oh, I see it. And, okay. uh, and erase. So I am going to share this now because I want this to be recorded. Share the screen. And I'm going to do this. So share. So you should be looking at this. You can do many things, like instead of writing with your pen, you can just type it. And that makes it easy. Right, move that around. You can do other things in option also, like add pictures. Okay, so for example, I like to work with a particular student from China playing some traditional Chinese board games. It's useful, she's only about four years old, but you can teach pretty relevant things. I could circle this area. Let me make this a little larger. Hmm. That way, oops, to move. Okay, that way I can move more freely. And I can ask, what do we call these particular areas? Or I can divide the board down the middle, across, and say, what is this? Mm. And this. Now, for us, it might be easy for us to say, this is the top, and this is the bottom. But they don't know that yet. So I can say, this is, we call this the top and the bottom. This is, these are corners, and this is the top right corner. How'd you get the colors, the different colors? Right here under draw, you have these options. So I can do green also. So for the left side and the right side, and maybe let's do a different color for the center. Let's do a blue. So I say, ah, what's this? It's really bad. Can undo. <laughs> what's this? Center. So it was good to teach such vocabulary words about this game, this game board, to this four-year-old student. And I think it's a really cool way to play a game, connect culture and learn English all at the same time. Uh, this technology hasn't existed before. and I think there's a lot of possibilities. So I'm going to stop the share going to exit this whiteboard and again let's follow up on being able to use this next time okay let me restart the slideshow and do the screen share i still see the whiteboard do i, I think that's close? because you actually have it open okay so i should close it mm -hmm. oh, oh beginning yeah. it's not what i want escape fast the bottom All right to we were on whiteboards from current slide and I'll screen share for us All right screen two I want the PowerPoint okay so can we see the PowerPoint mm -hmm. yeah okay let's move on articles I included this as a tool and not a reference because in my opinion, it's ready-made and it's ready, It's basically good to go as soon as you retrieve it from the website or maybe use the in Easy English News. So it's a tool in my opinion. Uh, it's the most popular and well-developed resource. And these are written in a logical progressive structure starting usually with vocab you can work with your students to learn the meanings of the words and also practice using them. 
the article is usually about relevant news, so it never gets dry. It's always something that's interesting. Uh, they are sorted in a level appropriate manner. So you can choose not just what your student is interested in, but also what is suitable for them in their current skill level. And at the end, usually there's leveled discussion prompts, starting from comprehension to opinion to abstract topics. And I have here, the favorite resource is ngu.com. Did we show that previously? Yes. Okay, so you recall ngu.com? Mm -hmm. I think we can save some time by not visiting there now. However, I said that the assignment between week four and week five was to complete uh, one article lesson via Zoom with your student. So just to test things out, you probably have to screen share. You'll be in the call together, you'll send the links, you'll split the screen so you can see them and read the article at the same time, whatever works for you, and go through it from beginning to end. And you'll see how it works. And it will be a good diagnostic procedure to see what will help your student. Congratulations. In my confident opinion, at this point in the training, you have enough pieces to start learning by doing. So it's great that you've already started connecting with the students. So don't wait. Go out there and try what you know, just like speaking. Don't wait 12 years of trying to memorize vocabulary before you start speaking. That will lead to disappointment. Okay, well done. Okay. Thank you. Questions about uh, today? Do we have to make an appointment with you to do that follow-up that you're talking about? Yes. So we can do that by email. Okay. Uh, you can send me an email after the lesson or at your convenience. Do we have you know, to email? Do you, yes. Today I sent it from the email you can use, um, the link to this one. Okay. Okay. Let's review. Ready? So question one, when should you stop preparing? When, when should you stop preparing? Yes. I like a trick question. Mm. <laughs> you got the whole two to one thing going, but I don't think you should ever stop preparing. In my opinion, stop when you get to that point of diminishing returns. Oh, diminish, okay. Returns. Mm -hmm. So now, it's like, you know, I've finished this lesson, but I haven't quite transcribed it into beautiful calligraphic writing yet. Like, I don't know how that's going to help you. Okay. Okay. So, number two, what is the rule of thumb for preparation time? Oh, you just said, she just said it, two to one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So however long you'll be teaching, probably twice that amount will be invested in preparation. Though, like we said with experience, improvisation becomes easier. Okay, what is the full throttle technique? Oh, that is jumping in like right now with, since we have our students and just like don't waiting you just, just go go for it true that is probably part of it uh the analogy dealt with the plane so mm -hmm. what was the relationship with the plane the plane had to really rev up before it could take off and build up fat, uh, speed before it was able to take off mm -hmm. and how is it after then once it's up in the air it's level off yeah, smooth, easy, and cruise. So yeah, if you start strong, probably it'll pay off. Question four, what four factors can minimize preparation time? Experience. Experience. Okay. Um, the knowledge of the student okay. that you're working with. 
the knowledge of the types of students. And the, the, ref, the references? And yes, the last section. Yeah, the, the ready reference? Resources. A resource. Yes. Yeah, I use the word resources because I thought it was a more general word. So like, if you talk about accounting and they say, what is an asset? They'll say, oh, it's a resource. So is that more or less clear? I don't know, but I think it's a general word, something useful, uh, which could be a reference tool game. Okay, question five. What were the three types of resources covered here? Resources. Game. It's one. Uh, tools. Tools. Mm -hmm. And references. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> your word. This is actually very linear, but if you keep all this in your memory, then you, when you're preparing, you will know what you can do. So question six, what were the four tools for online English tutoring covered here? Oh, what we just did. Okay, so the screen share. Um, What'd you say? I, I said screen share. Also. Oh, okay. okay. Um, A split screen. Split screen. Mm -hmm. The whiteboard. Whiteboard. And, and um, the articles. That's right. All right. Awesome. Okay. Last question. What is the assignment for the coming week? A uh, read week four. Um, prepare the. Uh, uh, what is it? You said. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to check with you. For read uh, week four, and then prepare an ESL activity. Mm -hmm. Now that you've seen some games, articles. Uh, the screen share, those things. And you know the lesson plans. We did the unit lesson model last time, which was like introduction, mechanics one, mechanics two, mechanics three, free practice, and then mock reality. You could pick one of those components and fill it with something. You could put it in that context or you could come with something which could fit anywhere, some sort of game, for example. Okay, so there's no wrong answers to that. Just come with a question for the reading, come with an activity, and what else there is for. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Read two question. This one is actually not so much an assignment for this. It was begin the logistics process of meeting and contacting your students. Oh, oh, yeah. So you've already made first contact, great. Uh, mm -hmm. Please solidify your arrangements so that you can complete the assignments and start applying what you are learning as soon as possible. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. We finished. Okay. okay. So, mm, great job. And thanks for sticking through that one. I think that was the longest one because we started soon and we went a full hour and a half. So I guess I'll see you okay. next week. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Take care.